All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are joining us from today. Uh, my presentation is going to be about a pedagogical model that I would like to introduce and contribute to the literature uh, through uh, multiple frameworks based on multi-literacies and bridging activities frameworks. So today I'm going to start with multiple definitions of LL. I'm sure you are familiar with the definitions so far, uh, just to remind, just as a reminder. And then uh, I would like to show how we moved in the LL research, uh, uh, the directions that we have taken and specifically focus on what was going on in the L to TL context, second language teaching and learning. And I will be talking about two main models which inspired the pedagogical model that I'm recommending. And we will have some activities uh, to show how this model can be applied into classroom context. And we will have an open mic and Q&A session at the end. Uh, so the typical definition, a standard definition of linguistic landscapes is what you see on the screen. So basically language of the signs, the language surrounding us, in a particular context. However, as we move forward, you know, the definition of linguistic landscapes uh, have evolved as well. For example, uh, Malinowski in the introduction of editors in Linguistic Landscape Journal says, the field of LL attempts to understand the motives, uses, ideologies, language varieties and contestations of multiple forms of languages as they are displayed in those spaces. So it's not really just the language, but also non-linguistic elements and how they you know, co-create meaning and the cultural uh, meanings and values behind those meanings and the history and sociocultural comp uh, composition of a geographical area. Uh, more of a diachronic and uh, look at the uh, landscapes as well, and how power and ideology plays all of that, all in that. And let's take a look at two quick examples from New York City. On the left, we see uh, lots of private signs, as you can see, Fifth Avenue, very colorful, like a heaven for linguistic landscapes, we can say. And on the right side, we see uh, New York's uh, city train uh, uh, schedule. It's uh, public and it's specifically governed and organized by the local government there. And now I would like to share this example, which is really interesting and how uh, language is moving and very flexible in public environment. For example, in the first one, it says, my child is an honor student, my governor is not. So that's the original text, you know. But then somebody played, you know, with the text, and then you see how the public text has changed and evolved. So it really shows the true uh, flexible and fluid nature of, uh, you know, uh, linguistic landscapes and why it shouldn't be taken as something static. You know, it's constantly changing, moving, and depends on how you look at it. And I'm sure, uh, I think, uh, if, we, if we know whether this is a, let's say, Republican state or Democratic state, you know, in terms of political uh, views of the uh, residents, uh, it may take a completely different meaning as well. And another field that's relevant to uh, linguistic landscapes uh, and within part of it is schoolscapes. So I want you to, you know, take a look at those two uh, signs and images. Uh, maybe you can share what you see. Uh, obviously, we have English and Spanish. Uh, can you tell us, you know, can you type your comments, what you see, you know, in terms of positionality, the colors, uh, you know, the way of writing, uh, style, uh, you know, what can you say about those two signs? Uh, these are taken in a bilingual school in Texas, uh, United States, by the way. Uh, on the left side, you see a lunch schedule for visitors. Spanish adjectives in red letters, yes. 
that's a great observation uh, and it's not surprising really. And uh, there was this study conducted by my colleague, uh, Steve Prismas. He said that blue is often associated with more relaxment in United States society. There was a research about it, but red was more, you know, furious. And another observation by Cardenan, English at the top uh, and blue and English is, you know, in capital as Sarah and Sil uh, Sylvia observe and the colors, uh, you know, this is really interesting. Uh, and the left and right positionality, top and bottom positionality. So we have a lot, you know, uh, a lot of things going on depending on the, uh, the colors, the positions that we have in a regular sign. Uh, and yes, italics used for the words uh, for the days in Spanish. Uh, now let's take a look at another one. Um, so left sign and right sign. Uh, maybe you can take a moment to... Uh, yes, Merinda, it's it's great, you know, to show it exotic, like a, a maybe a romanticized view of language, we can say. Again, here we have uh, Spanish weekdays in parentheses. And, you know, English weekdays are more colorful, supposedly, <laughs> than, you know, plain, kind of boring, I don't know, Spanish here. And also, you know, those languages are written from left to right. So you are more inclined to look at the uh, left first, right? Uh, when you see uh, home away from no home sign on the left, we see that uh, Spanish is on the right, but it's blocked, you know, with another sign. Uh, and it's not just on the right, but it's also at the bottom. And we have orange sign on the uh, right side of the picture, notice and aviso. So uh, it's the same thing is there. Uh, so aviso is uh, on the right, yes. And parenthesis uh, indicating additional thoughts. So it's not really you know, equal. Uh, so they don't have the same standards. So this is a really uh, great example of uh, positionality of languages and ideologies and how both of them uh, take play. So when we look at the extensions of LL research, recently Shohami and uh, Penny Cook uh, have published a chapter in a really great book and uh, it's quite recent and they have discussed the directions that linguistic landscape research have taken. The first one was geopolitical and it's mostly, you know, naming the uh, languages and uh, it's, it's more about public space and, uh, and geopolitical uh, domains were mostly in the North, you know, rather than the South or the global South. Uh, and, uh, and then the second stage is more of semiotic research. And it's more about, you know, prioritizing uh, not just language in the landscape, but also, you know, uh, landscape as language itself. So, which is really interesting and more powerful and comprehensive. And then rather than, you know, specifically counting languages, having a more, you know, translanguaging approach where languages are more fluid and you don't necessarily, you know, locate those items. And in the next uh, extension uh, or uh, strand of research, we have ethnographic. LL research. Uh, so it's the language is not just, you know, it doesn't have one function, one meaning, and it's multiple. And we also need to pay attention to, you know, who is looking at the sign and the place of the sign, the intended audience, uh, what are the social, cultural, and political institutions involved, and what kind of reactions the passerbys are showing. And finally, we have pedagogical development, which is uh, emerging uh, in the last decade, and this will be the focus for today. And when we look at the focus of prior research, uh, it's mostly uh, focusing on, you know, agentive LL-centered inquiries as part of LL projects, meaning that teachers often provide linguistic landscape projects to their students, 
and students go outside and then conduct those projects. Uh, so they develop a sense of agency and understanding of uh, role of languages in the society. Uh, one of the original works and pioneering works is by Peter Sayer in Mexico. Uh, he analyzed uh, he analyzed functions of languages through extensions, uh, ext extension activities. He recommended this as a way to interpret specifically functions of English in Oaxaca, in Mexico, uh, and what kind of functions the English had. And then uh, Roland uh, followed Sayer's model and uh, in Japanese context did the same to what extent English is present in local communities. Later, Chern and Dooley uh, suggested an activity called Literacy Walk, basically taking students outside the classroom and you know walking in the neighborhood, watching the signs and analyzing together, really collaborative you know, work. Um, and they also, it also involved you know, code breaking, text participation, a participation among the others. So, <clears throat> oops, Dule, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Melinda, for the, you know, we are exposed to seeing your name. So, uh, Dule, it should be. Thank you for the correction. And, and then we have, when we come into the 2020s, which, you know, we have uh, research booming actually uh, in this area. Uh, we have Maxim doing LL in study abroad context, which is really great work uh, if you're interested. So there are German uh, study abroad students and they're exploring German in Austria and how integrating it into uh, a study abroad context. This gives you really infinite ideas on how to you know, use LL in that kind of situation. And later Bever and Richardson is conducting a research on the positionality of German in Tucson, Arizona, which is really interesting because it's a border city to Mexico and uh, Spanish is uh, more common, obviously there and uh, not German, but still they find way to integrate German uh, LL practices into curriculum. And finally, uh, LL has been adopted in virtual exchange and telecollaboration projects, very, very new uh, Prismas, uh, and his colleagues, including me, we have conducted a research on telecollaboration and we asked uh, pre-service teachers developing lesson plans based on actually this model. Uh, it's, it's going to be coming out this September, hopefully. And uh, the, the difference of this research, I think the major contribution is that it involves uh, three institutions. So we have Mexico, Turkey, and United States. And recently, very, very fresh off the press, Vinagra has uh, a great research on uh, virtual exchange. I think she did it with Columbia, New York. Uh, uh, I would recommend you to take a look at it. It's quite new and recent. Uh, yes, Arizona has a strong uh, German department. I actually have done my PhD at Arizona. So uh, I know some folks. <laughs> So let's take a look at LL research in L2TL context. Uh, so there is the potential and possibilities because you know students take different roles. They are not passive uh, users, passive, sorry, learners, but they are taking the role of investigating and using the language through LL research. And also with LL, you can provide extension activities to bridge the outside of the classroom with the classroom, which is one of the problems that we experience. You know, we have the textbook, but it's kind of disconnected sometimes, uh, especially with uh, local communities that will be, uh, you know, more meaningful. And incidental language learning taking place. Previous research reports that, you know, being exposed to those signs and analysis uh, provides uh, learners to experience incidental learning. And then finally, uh, multiple research indicates that students uh, can develop, you know, pragmatic awareness, multimodal, transcultural awareness uh, towards using the language, which are all valuable uh, competences in modern classrooms. 
And of course, uh, it, everything is not really pinky and uh, peaceful and colorful. We have some limitations, especially how are we going to bridge theory with practice? That's a major issue that we have to cover. And we have lack of pedagogical models developed particularly for LL uh, in second language uh, teaching and learning. So the majority of the research is like single research activity. So yes, everything is adding on one to another, but there is uh, not a systematic way to integrate it. Uh, we still need to develop that. And how are we going to select materials? How are we going to adapt and appropriate them? And while doing it, to what extent we will be able to analyze and address learners' interests, proficiency levels, and ages. So these are the questions that we have to take into account as well. So the question, the major question is, how can linguistic landscape serve as a site for implementing activities based on different types of learning? And how can we make use of technologies to maximize the values? of LL, which is uh, important as well. So uh, informed by multi-literacies framework and bridging activities uh, framework, uh, I proposed a model called a literacy-based pedagogical model, linguistic landscapes in second language teaching and learning. And in order to you know, understand this model, uh, let's take a look at the frameworks. The original frameworks. Multiliteracies framework uh, is developed by a, a, a series of scholars that came together and developed. Uh, they are called New London Group, and it dates back to 1996. And the the model encompasses two multi. So it's not just the uh, context; uh, it's also the modality. So by that we mean, you know. Uh, students engage in meaning making processes in multiple spaces, but also through not just one single modality, modality, but also, you know, oral, visual, spatial patterns are involved as well. So we provide students a space for negotiating meaning, especially differences in meaning exchanges, and also incorporation of multimodal resources. And this model offers uh, four major dimensions. Situated practice is more about uh, learners' engagement in meaningful practices without a critical reflection. Uh, so they build on their previous knowledge in situated practice. And in overt instruction, they systematically analyze the formal or informal features of the texts or signs, as we can think for LL context. And in critical framing, uh, they are encouraged to notice and critically analyze, uh, especially the relationships between language use and sociocultural uh, context. And, uh, and then we have transformed practice uh, where learners, you know, based on the text, learners uh, target uh, alternative audiences as part of these transformed practice. And moving on to bridging activities framework, which is recommended by uh, Steve Thorne and John Reinhardt. Uh, they are both actually well-known scholars in call scholarship, uh, computer assisted language learning. And this model is mostly developed for digital texts and practices mainly. Uh, however, uh, like uh, multi-literacies framework, it's also, informed by literacy-centered pedagogical frameworks, particularly awareness-oriented ones. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, and the emphasis, the difference between, uh, difference from multi-literacies framework is that this uh, model prioritizes learners' involvement uh, and, uh, you know, and focuses on using the materials brought by students themselves. Uh, so it's not the teacher necessarily bringing the materials, but students are actively taking part in that role. And we have three phases in the implementation of bridging activities. The first one involves noticing, comprehending, and critically analyzing linguistic and social features of the uh, texts or the materials uh, with the, uh, under the guidance of the teacher. 
And in the second phase, the learners design appropriate texts and participate in communities, especially digital communities, through overt instruction and modeling and also collaboration. And finally, they create their own uh, materials and texts uh, in this section. So looking at uh, both of them, I think uh, it gives us an idea moving forward. Uh, you know, we need, to, we need to systematically incorporate uh, LL into foreign language classrooms, uh, especially for students with different levels of learning. And in that, uh, I suggest this model uh, as a complementary work, uh, but it should be understood that, you know, this model is not uh, trying to, uh, it should not be used as a replacement of activities designed and developed by language teachers. Instead, it's, uh, you know, intended to present new ways, uh, new ways for uh, teachers to engage learners in understanding how language and non-linguistic resources, you know, get together and co-create meaning, uh, especially the sociocultural values behind those meanings and emerging uh, semiotic productions, uh, especially carried out at learners' own communities. So uh, based on both models, four stages are followed. Situated practice is the first where learners develop an awareness of linguistic landscapes and semiotics through activating their background knowledge. And in guided analysis uh, or exploration, uh, we have students recognizing and critically analyzing linguistic features or sociocultural features. And then the next stage is also taking place in class. It's called creation. We want students to, you know, uh, develop their own texts through teacher provided tasks so that they have a better adaptation into how these materials are produced. And finally, students engage with the text and develop uh, a similar genre uh, or product in a similar genre uh, in these signs. So they don't necessarily have to accept the model, they can reject or adapt. Uh, the discourses that are uh, available or present in the analysis that they see. So these are the uh, stages that uh, might be used. Uh, and, you know, the, as you can see with the circles, it's not necessarily, you know, fixed stages. You can adapt, go back and come back to the original, uh, you know, stage that you want, or you want to spend more time in a particular stage. Uh, the, the, the major difference of this, I believe, model is that we have transformed practice. You know, in LL research, we ask students to, you know, uh, discuss and engage in uh, compre uh, conversations about the text and the meanings behind them, but we don't give students opportunities to create their own signs or texts or models. So, uh, informed by bridging activities, this part is really important. So if you want, we can move on to the uh, active part and I will ask you to, you know, involve a bit more. Uh, so let's give a try to this. Look at the sign, please. Uh, maybe you can type and join me. What do you notice first? What you see? Uh, what type of sign is it? Where do you think the picture is taken? I'm sure you have some ideas. Could be, yes, uh, Melinda, yes. Cardelan, the mermaid, there is a mermaid uh, in a ship. Uh, the images are created uh, in a boat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whatever is the first thing that you can uh, Amusement park, advertising campaign, fighting about gender toilets, Bien. Uh, Make me think of a film. Uh, which film? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so you see, you know, it's a single 
Im image and sign, but we have so many reactions. And when you don't know the context, you get a lot of different responses. So uh, that's what makes it really interesting. And here we rely on the background knowledge of the students. So they activate it, they become familiar. Oh, the shape of water, yes. <laughs> it's a great one. And let's reveal, time to re reveal. The first guess was the correct one. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a public restroom, you know, uh, and yes, Frank, get around the complex and controversial issue of gender and accessibility through humor, you know. So which restroom am I going to use? Is it going to be this one or that one? And uh, so the important thing here is, you know, just wash your hands, be clean, especially during COVID. Uh, it's even more important. Uh, so in this stage, you know, we reveal the second part of the uh, sign, which you can give, you know, in the very beginning too. But I think that when you, you know, crop and present it uh, in a limited way, it creates more curiosity and interest. Uh, and students, you know, uh, spend some extra mental effort which results in you know, further uh, thinking and understanding of the material. And here, you, know, you can talk about uh, specifics of the detail, like what kinds of cultural differences or similarities are displayed through both images. And can you see a sign like this in your country? Why or why not? And what's the intent of the message? And then creation stage is about, you know, after understanding the sign or going through it, we want students to engage in activities uh, in classroom. You know, in classroom activities are important because it's a safe atmosphere for students to play with the signs and images. So you can either, let's say, draw a character which would replace one of the drawings in the picture and you know, give the same or similar meaning to that sign. Or alternatively, if you want to focus on, let's say, a uh, linguistic aspect of it, you can cover the text, textual part, and ask them develop, you know, and change it, uh, uh, making uh, and forcing them to make guesses. So this would be in classroom activity. And obviously, depending on the level of learners, you can change and adapt it into your own classroom. And finally, transform practice. So we sent students to, you know, outside the classroom and we give them some tasks, you know, like take or draw pictures of restroom signs in different places you visit through the week and bring them into class. So what kind of things that you see, how are they represented? Or, you know, if they can't really, uh, if they can't really uh, go out or unable to do that, especially during COVID, they can make a Google search of restroom signs and look at it. And, and then they can find uh, sample structures and sentences, including just in it, you know, because just wash your hands. This is more pragmatic again. And finally, you know, my favorite activity, why don't you design your own restroom sign, you know, depending on the place that, the, the, you know, the genre of the uh, shop. For example, on the right side, you see, uh, you know, that's where you would get, I guess it would be a coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Sylvia, that would be great, yes. I want that. I want that happening, you know. So through this way, you kind of uh, involve students' imagination, run crazy. And I have some more examples, really. And you, if you can't find those signs, you can make use of digital wilds, you know. Bring them. So uh, men to the left, because women are always right. And then if you're a Star Wars fan or, you know, if you can't hold it, let's say, uh, and then uh, a biological perspective to it or the dresses, uh, you know, you can have a lot of discussions going on around those signs. And, you know, and the start point is just a single sign, you know, that's what I really like about this type of activity and you engage students in multiple uh, discussions. And another one is tipping culture. Uh, I'm not sure if you have, uh, 
Yes, we should do it. We should develop a project for that, Sylvia, uh, a, a data bank with those signs. And you know, uh, the, the second one is tipping culture. Not every culture has tipping, right? Uh, I mean, in Turkey, for example, we have it mostly in touristic spaces or larger cities. Uh, so it, it, it's a great idea to you know, uh, give target language culture or uh, developing intercultural uh, awareness. So look at the last question. I want you to answer the last question. How much money do you think is it in there? You know, that's the creative part of this activity. You know, let's get over the signs and we see the card shape. You know, why do you think it's used there? You know, uh, is it to create a sympathy or, and what time do you think the picture is taking? bringing, you know, special elements into that too. Is it morning? You know, they have to think about light in the picture or the amount of money, you know, collected towards the end of the day. Uh, and the guided analysis involves further examples. So we have different types of tip jars or tip box used in different cultures. For example, on the left, uh, you see a, a coffee shop called Vaquero. Uh, in Spanish, obviously, cowboy, right? So it makes sense that they have used something similar. And on the right side, we have uh, a, another text focusing on a textual analysis. It's an incomplete sentence uh, and for a job well done. And also, yes, exactly. It's, it's an interdisciplinary approach and CLIL even, you know, for math, currencies, counting money, a lot of uh, involvement in there. And look at the, uh, this one. <laughs> God knows when you don't tip, you know. So, uh, you know, if, if it's a conservative place, that will be very creative to use. And then I can, I can only swim in dollars. Please don't let me die. You know, like, you know, creating, again, sympathy. And we have money is the root, uh, root of all evil. Why don't you cleanse yourself here? Uh, so it's, it's all about... <laughs> Yes, it's Texas, uh, also Arizona, <laughs> uh, northern part. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of signs which are really interesting and, and tip boxes are really very creative because you want some money from them, you know, and you should create some kind of connection with the audience. Uh, so what we give as an uh, activity, why don't we ask them to design a tip box, a jar, so that they can uh, they can have a tax to attract more money. You know, you bring a lot of creativity of students into that. So, uh, and a second activity would be, why don't you draw two images so that people compare, you know, so you make it in a more competitive uh, level, like a competition, cycle cops or cycle cops. Uh, that was a coffee shop that I used to go in Arizona. They always use uh, that. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, Frank. Uh, red and blue could be. I, I haven't really thought about that, but could be. Uh, and yes, we have some people who are willing to help the cat. That's the goal, you know. Uh, and so moving on to bridging activities. Again, this was in classroom time, possibly. And why don't they, why don't you have a tip jar contest at school? You know, you can give fake monies to students and then ask them to tip in their favorite boxes and the highest tip box wins. Uh, so that would be, you know, engaging and then a lot of counting and money and a lot of English language is involved. And then if uh, the level of students are more advanced, you can ask them to, you know, compare tipping culture in the US and their home countries. They can visit uh, restaurants and coffee shops and observe uh, what kind of tip boxes they have there. And also talk to, you know, uh, customers about their tip uh, leaving habits uh, and they can come back to discuss, you know, that's the, that's the most important part of this, uh, you know, we don't just let them go out and explore and do, they have to come back and represent and show so that we have the nonlinear uh, circle continuing on. 
Wow, uh, that's a that's a great that's a great uh, uh, sample. Uh, Melinda has a really nice comment raising uh, money to help refugee families through creating tip jars. Wow, that's that's huge. So you can use that for uh, social justice or inequality projects as well. Um, okay, uh, next one is uh, sorry, it should be stage one. So this is taken uh, in NASA uh, shop. Uh, it's not rocket science. Oh wait, yes, it is actually. So you help them, you know, see the details here. You know, when you look at it, you see a lot of stars, moon orbiting, and uh, some uh, vocabulary and color choices are really uh, great. And uh, and moving on, we have you know. T-shirt talk, uh, Frank, I loved your T-shirt yesterday. <laughs> that was really great. Uh, but T-shirts are really interesting, you know? Who is the audience? It's not yourself, right? People are reading it, you know, through your chest or the back. You are not the audience, people are. So ask them, discuss about this. And uh, so we have a lot of heart shapes again, moon inside of a moon itself physically. You know, uh, there may be a lot of uh, discussions and plays. And again, another one, if you are more playful and if you want to involve, you know, a lyrical talk <laughs> that's rhyming. Uh, this is so Sheldon Cooper. I'm not sure if you are familiar with Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory. That would be something that he would say. Um, and, and another thing, again, involving chemistry in a breaking bad fashion, you know, uh, periodical, uh, you know, periodic teaching that and, you know, uh, talking about uh, different aspects of the details. I have to move a bit faster, sorry about that. And then in creation part, why don't you let students create their own t-shirt signs, you know, maybe they will have those fashion designers in the, in, inside them and you never know who will be, you know, the next generation of uh, Gucci or, <laughs> you know, the others. So, and then in the transform practice on the right side of the image, this is just a casual image that I have taken on my uh, nephew, you know, Look at that. It's just a simple sign for middle school student, you know, middle school student t-shirt, but there is so much going on in that t-shirt. So why don't you ask students to visit clothing store and take pictures of English texts on the clothes or type them down, you know, and then checking wardrobe at home and see if they have anything on them. And it's not necessarily just English, you know, it could be other semiotic elements as well. And then finding a friend and asking them, you know, oh, do you know what's written on you or something like that? And the answer might be no, and which would make it really interesting, you know, questioning why are you dressing up uh, in a way that you don't really know the meaning. And another one, I'm not sure, is there anyone who is familiar with this guy? Do you know this guy? Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, Jaworski and Leah Lu. Uh, it's called Words We Wear. Great. I will definitely check into that on Instagram. Yes, the, the sign guy, right? So imagine showing something like this and contextual uh, space is really important here. So he's in front of friends uh, sign, uh, as you know, very uh, popular. Uh, TV show dating back to 1990, uh, 90s, uh, but he has this sign and then asking students about, oh, what do you think? It says, do you think the image has anything to do with it? And then at the revealing stage, we have Seinfeld is way better than Friends. And I know that some of you completely agree. Uh, I love Seinfeld. Uh, so, uh, and you know, you are asking about guesses, uh, students guesses, and they are actively involved. And it's not necessarily just that, you know, stop standing up when the plane lands. Yes, grandma, I'm still single. You know, why don't you use it as a way to discuss, you know, some of the odd behaviors that we are engaging in society, right? Come up with that. And how about uh, mother words or 
phrases by your mother, <laughs> typical phrases, what would he or she says? Yes, Melinda, exactly. That's what he does. He goes around the world. I think he's located in um, New York or East Coast, uh, East US, Eastern US. He holds up signs and posts them on Instagram. Uh, sign, dude. <laughs> yes, we do. And another one, uh, you know, for critical media uh, analysis, your meal doesn't need a photo shoot and your dog doesn't need a social media account. No offense to those who have their accounts for their pets, sorry, in advance, this is not my view. Uh, so you can use it to develop critical social media awareness as well, you know, what kind of behaviors do we engage online and what do they mean? And some in uh, class participation, why don't you create a sign featuring a talk to one of your family members? like your mom's repeated reminders, that would be. And then creating a sign featuring a critique of social media posts. We have nearly wet people, you know, constantly sharing <laughs> posts and post images and people do not want to see them anymore, uh, that kind of thing. Or, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, it could, it could actually. Uh, and, uh, and another one is, uh, we, we have done this activity actually in class and some of them said, oh, I don't want to see what you are watching on Netflix or what you are listening on Spotify, you know, so you discuss why people share those things, you know, and what it means, who is it for, uh, there is a lot going on, you know, uh, in terms of discussion. And they can, you can ask them Google search, do it with sign and try to gather some information. You can ask them visit his Instagram account, choose one of the images and bring to share in class. And my favorite one is the last one really, design and create a sign to create awareness on a social issue, such as violence, animal cruelty, equal rights, et cetera, and bring it to the class to talk about your message, you know, like a, uh, like a uh, walking of science and people are, the students are engaging in different kind of discussions. So you take one single sign and, you know, be creative and uh, make it more interesting. So I have some preset of questions uh, adapted from Roland and, and I'm sure you, you can find it uh, in the book as well. So, uh, and I would recommend uh, a, a, an application called Linkscape. Uh, it's, it's really great application. It's a smartphone application where you can ask students, you know, to go out and take pictures and geo tag them. And they can also select the languages and they can add comments as well. If you contact uh, Linkscape owners, uh, Dr. Pushki at the University of Luxembourg, you can also create your own specific project. Uh, and folks over at Hamburg, they also have LinguaSnap, which is another uh, device, an app that you can use. And here is an example. You can also digitally use it. So uh, you can just pull up the map and click on the images and you can have a lot of discussions uh, evolving around that. Uh, all right, I was a bit fast towards the end. I'm sorry about that, but uh, uh, that's about it. Thank you very much for listening and interacting throughout the presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. You're getting lots of uh, semiotic claps in the, in the chat, lots of signs, icons. Um, I think we have time for some questions. I'm sure there are some questions. Um, and uh, uh, there were two or three posted in the Padlet that you said you, you would address if you want to. I don't know yes, if you've already yes. addressed them. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Melinda, there are two pages for... Uh... Yeah, the second one, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> okay. Doing too, too many things at once. The first one was to stimulate questions for you and then the second one was to be, to give you any feedback after the talk because mm -hmm. i've been asking for feedback from all of the from all the talks so to to keep you in the same 
uh, pattern mm -hmm. as the others. I, I did two padlets for you. So yes, there were two for you. Uh, or is there, you can, there were posts in both of them, I believe. So mm -hmm. you're more than welcome to address either one if, if you. Sure. Uh, so the first one, Sarah is asking about how about using LL in EFL classes, but you know, causing a negative impact as regard to language inequalities and language minorities. I think that's a great question because we are circulating uh, the discourses that we see around us and we are basically reintroducing it into classroom context and it's kind of repeating the dominant discourses. However, in I think in this uh, model, if you are, you know, if you are doing especially transform practice, you provide students to be creative and reappropriate those discourses, you know, uh, what if let's say uh, Arabic would be on the same level as uh, Hebrew, let's say, uh, you know, uh, so I think that way you would overcome this. And I think that would be a perfect way to address those inequalities through non-representation of those languages in that particular, you know, context or the images. So rather than, you know, recirculating, repeating those signs, I would recommend, you know, reappropriating it by involving students to be more active. Uh, that would be my uh, comment for that. If you have, you know, any uh, additions, feel free to type. Um, another one by uh, Josuan Aponte, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, again, similar, uh, similar line, what impact will bringing content full of dominant discourses have? So uh, it, it's very similar to uh, what we uh, just mentioned, you know, rather than recirculating, repeating the dominant discourses put forward by uh, dominant ideologies in our society, you can reappropriate them, you know, you give students alternatives. Even if it's just tipping jar, you know, how about bringing tipping jar in multiple cultures, not just English, you know, what could be different or uh, a, a relatively heavier topic, let's say, uh, there are signs only in, let's say, Spanish, but how about the representation of Catalan or Basque, what would you write if you add them? or maybe Turkish in Berlin, I don't know, uh, or other minority languages, let's say in the Netherlands, depending on the context. So uh, that would be my uh, inclination uh, about it. And I'm also checking another uh, comment. Uh, I have a question by Wilfred uh, Gapas. It reminds me of uh, Helot and Olaire uh, describes as the pedagogy of possible because this is what it appears to demonstrate. How does your literacies based LL in L2TL model impact students' experiences of language learning? Uh, I, have, I have had a chance to look at the model that you are mentioning. So thank you for posting this earlier. Uh, I agree that it has similarities. I will definitely check further. Uh, you know, we have tried this, this model at multiple levels, you know, in primary school, middle school, and high school students. Uh, so in most of the cases, when students were involved, uh, they, it, it, the activities increased their motivation. Um, sorry. Oops, I think it disconnected. For a while no you were frozen for just a minute but you're oh, okay. Back. okay 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 uh so uh what it does is it increased motivation of learners and you know they found a way to exert their agency so they uh, took control of uh their learning uh by uh through uh you know engaging in activities in that i think my connection has a bit of problem right now yeah, we're hearing you. Um, you do your your images freeze, but we're still hearing you. So okay, okay, I, I, great. <laughs> that's what matters. And then it comes right? back, and then it comes back. So I I know that, that that's disconcerting in a, in a way, but we are we are still getting you on okay. the audio. We're still hearing what you're saying. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that that's fine. And uh, there was another question by uh, somebody. I'm not sure who asked this, but. 
Uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, how about integrating uh, context, and, context and meaning creation and a communication model where noise and decoding is explored? I think in this model, it's really up to you, you know, you select what focus you want to have. And even though this is for foreign language learning purposes, as we have seen in examples, it could be uh, related to content or let's say you are teaching a course on migration, let's say, you can still use those signs and go through the model and be as flexible as you want because the target is to involve students and expose them to signs to make them aware of what's going on around them and have the potential to change it if they had the power to do so. Uh, so that would be my comment about it. Um, the other two comments are more specific. Uh, I would kindly ask the people to, because we are also running out of time, please feel free to email me. Uh, I would be definitely interested in providing further research on LL, on urban planning and public health. I run into some of them. Uh, and I am very interested in the project that uh, one of the participants asked about LL and language biographies. Uh, I would be happy to, you know, engage in conversation through email uh, about that. So. Thank you very much for answering all these questions. And some of them you got a little bit late and you, and you still, you did, we did not provide you with a whole lot of time to think about them. I mean, you've at, at, answered them and very brilliantly. Uh, I don't know, we have time for perhaps one more question if someone would like something about a clarification or like to, to ask something specific to the presentation that we just saw, anyone? Sylvia, would you like to, to say any final words? I, I, I just loved it, Osman. I think it's 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 not a not a surprise. Um, and I I I've I, I read I I have wrote written um, a comment um, praising the creativity of all the tasks and and the, their feasibility because sometimes uh, teachers just just feel overwhelmed about creating something from from scratch or finding new resources that's that's quite a problem also in the implementation of multilingual pedagogies and what you've shown is that all these resources are just around the corner and we just have to learn to observe so it was it's really it's it's very very creative and and very engaging and as i told you i will never go to a restroom again with <laughs> looking at those signs so you really changed my life <laughs> uh, it, it, that's the you know perks of studying linguistic landscapes you know you look at it and you see different things <laughs> I have to say that is not a compliment I have ever heard before, Sylvia. <laughs> oh wow! I'll never see restrooms the same way again. Okay, Belinda, we, that's yes. a very unique. <laughs> it was. It was really very good. Thank you so much. And but if, if I may, if I may, Melinda, we had we had a, uh, the presentation from Gabriella where restrooms, the doors from restrooms were also used by migrant students to express their own identity. So I think that restroom doors are also very important. So we'll never look at restrooms yes, again in the is, same way. Yeah, definitely a new aspect of how we see uh, public restrooms and completely agree. And, and Frank made a very a very wicked joke if you will allow me to continue with the pun of no rest room for the wicked yeah. so, <laughs> very good i liked the t-shirt idea and um i think that it's very creative uh idea as well to have the students become an, and and that's one of the european competences now isn't it the, what they call the entrepreneurship right so you could actually promote them then learning to design their own clothes and selling them or something like that so very creative thank you i agree with sylvia um i is there anyone any final comments and it was just it was not just about observing but creating exactly very much 
very much. It's more, it's making them much more active. And I think that that's been kind of the focus of all the presentations this week and, and how we can, I remember the comment yesterday of how we can turn students into sort of social activists, mm -hmm. um, to promote activism through all of these projects. And, and I'm, I'm really enjoying that underlying message that's coming through in everything in, in throughout the week. So uh, thank you again. Thank you so very much. I put a thank you in Turkish in the chat. I was just looking at it. Straight from Google, straight from Google, I admit, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. So, uh, but <laughs> yes, thank you very much for your talk. And um, I hope to see everyone again tomorrow. It's been wonderful. Uh, all the speakers are more than welcome to come back to the wrap up if, if you have time and you're interested. Uh, we'll be doing sort of uh, some, some breakout rooms to discuss everything we've done this week. and. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you again. And then thank you to everyone who's been here and has been all the way through this week. We're almost to the end. It is just, I don't know about you guys, but it has flown by for me. So, and it's been loads of fun and, and I'm enjoying it very much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, for